Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be looking at one particular part of the Minoan culture, and that is the funeral customs and rituals and tombs. Okay, so there's actually quite a lot that we need to know with this, and this might go on for a while, so you might decide to watch it in two chunks. Either way is fine, um, but there's quite a lot that you need to know in quite a lot of archaeological sources that we might not cover in its entirety throughout this presentation, but you should be having a look in your own books for. So what do we actually need to survive in this uh, study of funerary customs and tombs and things like that? Well, if you want to get the basic marks, at least 50% of this, here's what you must have. Okay, first of all, you have to know the different types of tombs that are present in Minoan society. You have to also have to understand why there are different tombs. So why do they not just think of the same sort of tomb from the early Minoan period all the way to the late Minoan period? and then further on into the Mycenaean period. You also have to understand it's not just about tombs, these physical tombs and burials, but also about what the bodies in those tombs and graves allow us to understand about the people, okay? We've talked about this before when we're doing Pompeii and Herculaneum, talking about how uh, science is now very interwoven with the study of history, and we're using biologists and anthropologists and things like that to study these bodies and tell us what they can tell us about the society. And you also need at least one to two tombs, specific tombs that you can recall and remember off here, okay? Now, if you really wanna be an amazing person in this subject, this is what you do need. You're gonna need three to four historians or archeologists that you can call on to analyze and evaluate opinions. So, you must have a sort of just going to be, uh, I'm just going to know a couple of these uh, tomb types. Your amazing is going to be, here's the tomb type and here's what a historian and archaeologist is saying about them and here's why it's important. You have to have the ability to explain the social and chronological differences between tombs. And you should be able to interweave the formal application of hard science, so things like biology and chemistry and things like that, into archaeological understanding of bodies. Now, we're not going to talk too much about the bodies today, um, and we'll do that in another lesson, but you need to understand what the bodies can tell us about the society. You should also be able to talk about as many tombs, specific tombs, as you can. The more tombs that you can talk about as examples, the more you're able to show what you know. So this is our table of just every type of burial that we're going to go through today, okay? And this is the bare basic simples. If you can remember nothing else, remember this tape, okay? So the first type that we have, and we'll go through all of these in more detail, is the rectangular or house tomb. It's got a T after it because it's an actual tomb. You'll notice that the ones at the bottom have a B because it's more to do with the burial rather than the tomb itself. So what is the rectangular or house tomb? Well, it's pretty obvious. It says exactly what it does on the tin. It's literally a rectangular burial site, okay? It is also communal, and we're going to talk about this word communal in quite a bit of detail, but I want you to remember it, communal. And the bodies are added from the top of the site. Now, there's a couple of them where you walk in the door and you basically place the body on the slabs and things like that, but we've seen a couple that we add from the top. And they are around Eastern Crete, around about 2600 to 2300 BC. So these are quite old tombs. Now, the next one that we have is the Tholos tomb. Okay, now what this is, is this is a circular structure with a dome roof. Okay, so very similar to the sort of house tomb. Okay, except it is literally just a big circle and then it has a dome roof on the top of it, okay? Now, these first appear on the Masara Plain near Phaistos around about 3,000, 2,600 BC. So they are quite old, okay? But they don't really kick off much until later. These appear in Central and Southern Crete. Now, the next one that we have is a chamber tomb, and this is an underground rock cut. So literally it's carved into the ground. This is most common in 1700 to 1450 BC and 1300 and 1100 BC. 
So there's a bit of a gap in these two types between when they actually appear. And this can be um, explained through changes in society and how they want to bury their dead. Now, these are found at Calibia, Pilaki, and Knossos. Now, the two types of burials that we're going to go through today as well is the ossuary and the larnax. Okay, now, what are ossuaries? Well, effectively, they're bone houses, okay, and they contain large collections of bones. So we are expecting to find the bones of dozens, if not hundreds of people when we're looking at an ossuary. They are placed there after the flesh has decayed, so they're full skeletons by this point. And they are usually in a rectangular tomb house, but not all the time. Very often you can find them in a tholos, which we'll discuss later on. The last one that we'll look at is the larnax. And this is when a body is placed in a clay container. Okay, It's literally shoving a body into a small box, sometimes a bathtub. And we'll look at that later on as well. So when we're doing burials and tombs, this is an example of what a HSC question might look at. Okay, so with reference to source K, what do tombs reveal about death and burial in this period? And this is a eight mark question from last year's paper. Okay, and you're given a little source here. This is one of Zolf A Minoan tomb. Okay, this in particular would be a Dolos tomb. There's something quite special about this Tholos tomb. And we might assume that that is actually a Mycenaean tomb, but we'll go through the differences on that. But if you were a clever little cookie, you would pick up on that. So you get a source, okay? And you have to talk about what do tombs reveal about death and burial. So they might only give you one tomb, but do not be mistaken. You have to talk about all the different types of tombs and burials, not just the one that's on the source there. So here is our map of tombs and burials in uh, Minoan Crete. So it's always good to come back and look at this map. Now, when we're do what we're doing today is we're going to be looking at three major burial sites, mainly those around Knossos, Pastos, okay, in particular looking at the plains of Masara, and also those at Moklos. Okay, these are three very important sites that we really want to remember. Gornia, which is next to Moklos, we do want to remember as well because it shares cemeteries with Moklos. Okay. So what do we mean when we're talking about funerary customs? Okay, well, funerals and burials in Manoan Creek seem to have undergone major changes throughout the years from pre-palatial early Minoan to the late Mycenaean. In case you have forgotten, pre-palatial means pre-palace period, before the Minoans started building palaces. Now, many customs related to the funeral and burial remain unknown. However, we can say with some certainty that the late Mycenaeans adopted some, if not many, of the Minoan burial customs. And this also makes it a bit difficult for us as historians and archaeologists. The Minoans are a evolving society. The way that they do their burial and funeral customs changes over time. They do not remain consistent, there's evolution. And one of the big problems that we have is when the Mycenaeans come to Minoan Crete and take it over, they bring in their own customs and they also adopt some Minoan customs and we have to figure out what is Minoan and what is Mycenaean. Now, this one that we talked about before is a really important one that we have to remember. And this is communal burial. Now, one of the most important features to identify Minoan burials is the idea of communal burials. Although different types of tombs have been found throughout Minoan archaeology, the idea of communal graves or bodies being put into community graves with little separation between them remain markedly common throughout Minoan history. So what does that communal burial actually mean? It means we as a society are very used to one grave, one person, okay? For every grave that you've got is one person in there. However, the Minoans are quite different. You've got one grave, you could have 10 people in there if you have a grave at all, okay? Most of the times, Minoans are gonna be buried in tombs, which could contain dozens, if not hundreds of people. 
The Minoans are buried very closely together, and it's only at certain periods in their history when they actually start separating people in their burials. What this means is that whenever we discover a tomb in the Minoan archaeology, we're finding a whole shed load of bodies for us to study. Okay, so really wrap your head around that idea of communal burial. Now, the idea of communal burial has been an integral part of the idea of an egalitarian Minoan society, with little between classes being distinguished in their burial sites. So what does this mean? Well, we think that Minoan society was egalitarian, which means that they didn't have much of a social hierarchy. Everyone was thought to be equal. And a lot of people have said that this has really been viewed in their burial. Everyone was buried together, and it doesn't seem like rich people got a very big difference in how they were buried. However, it's important to note that over time, a Larnax was eventually provided for seemingly richer people. So at the start, we see a lot of evidence of egalitarian um, society in the Minoan practice of burial. However, we can say that as the society begins to develop and perhaps they had more of a social hierarchy as they developed, we see these richer people being buried in these Larnaxes, okay? And you can see here, this is what a Larnax is. It's effectively a chest. Very often they were actually bathtubs as well. And you would literally stuff a body inside of that Larnax. Now, some of you might be wondering, I don't think you can actually fit a body inside of that small chest. You absolutely can. Remember, Minoans are not buried like we would normally bury a body, which is horizontally, okay, with its hands over. No, they actually shove their bodies into these chests in a sort of fetal position. So they're curled up, okay? And even with the Larnaxes, you might find that you have multiple people shoved in that Larnax. Okay. Also keeping in mind that sometimes they empty out the bodies after the flesh has decayed from that body and then put the bones of the previous person in another spot when we'll talk about ossuaries, we'll discuss this a bit more, and then fill it in with a, another corpse. I'm imagining that their tombs have quite a particular smell around them. So another important thing to remember about these communal burials is our historian for this one, which is Brannigan, okay? Now, Brannigan suggests that these communal burials constitute evidence of a clan or family structure in Crete because several such burial sites were used simultaneously over the course of hundreds of years in each small area. So what we're saying is these burial sites were used for quite a number of years. And we do have evidence that in one burial site, a family would have its entire generations buried, okay? Could just be a small knit family or what's called the large knit family clan. This can involve distant cousins, uncles, and things like that. But we do believe that this sort of communal burial, or at least Brannigan believes, was family or clan based where everyone is piled into the same tomb, basically which makes sense because if you have a bit of worship of the dead or looking after the dead in a religious sense, you would want the family to do that for you, to look after those that have died. So I've alluded to this a couple of times before, but one of the big funerary customs that we have is the ossuary. Okay, and this is the big thing that comes in with the communal burial. Now, as discussed before, Minoans were not afraid of moving bodies after they had been inhumed. And I really want you to remember this word, inhumed, means that you were um, putting it into the earth. If you're taking it out of the earth, it means to exhume. Often there would be storerooms in the tombs. Now, these chambers were called ossuaries or bone houses and could store hundreds of bodies. When these became too full, all bones besides the skull would be thrown out. So this is an example of an ossuary found in the cave of Hagios Chalambos, okay? Now this is a relatively small ossuary, but basically what would happen is once the tomb is full of all of these corpses, then they start making little additional storerooms attached to the tomb. 
and they put all of the body, uh, all of the bones remaining in those storerooms. Now, eventually, even those storerooms are going to get filled up. So what do they do? Well, they chuck out the hip, their arms, the legs, okay? All that they maintain is the skull, okay? And this makes sense when we're looking at it in an ancient society because they probably thought that this is where the soul resides, this is where the thinking is done. Let's keep that because it's important that we keep that. We must show reverence to it. And you will find that even in a lot of modern day societies. I believe there's a lot of Southeast Asian societies where the head is where it's believed that the soul resides. Therefore, you cannot touch people on their heads and things like that. So really important thing to remember with the Minoans is they're not afraid of moving around the dead, touching them and things like that. We have this opinion as a society that when a person is in the ground, buried, or they have been cremated, you do not touch them at all. The Minoans have a completely different idea of this, which is basically, eh, your body's taking up too much space. We're going to throw you in a storeroom. And then when that storeroom's getting too filled up, uh, we're going to chuck out all the excess bones and only keep your skull. So they want to save space. This would be absolutely horrendous when we're looking at it from our own society's point of view. But for the Minoans, it made complete sense. So, like we were saying, another important thing to note about Minoan burial practices is that they were not shy about disturbing the dead. Minoan tombs and ossuaries show evidence of bones being moved multiple times to back places to make way for newer inhabitants. This has been shown at Moklos, where there is evidence of tombs being repeatedly used. Okay, so you get rid of the old guys, they go into a storage room, make way for the new dead. So once again, looking at our map, really important to remember Moklos is quite important for us. Okay, this is where a lot of our um, bone houses can be found, especially the uh, house tombs. Really important for us to remember these sites. So let's talk about tombs and house tombs specifically in more detail now. Okay, so basically these were literal houses for the dead. This is a rectangular tomb, roughly the size of the Minoan house, containing various square rooms inside. The largest and most impressive of these tombs is roughly 39 times 30 metres in size. So when we're looking at these house tombs, they could be built for the purpose that they believe that they are going to be living there in the afterlife, okay? And that these are sort of building them to scale of what they could actually live in. It could just be the fact that these are what the Minoans were also used to building, so they built their tombs in the exact same manner. I would also keep in mind that you can also see that some of these tombs are also two-storey, which is an incredible feat for the ancient world. When we were doing Pompeii and Herculaneum, we noticed that two-storey houses only really came about just before the eruption of um, Mount Vesuvius. But we can see in the Minoan society that they were already getting onto the idea of two-storey housing. Now, we can see just how seriously the Minoans took the whole life after death concept here. While some houses, house tombs used a cliff face as the back wall, others were completely freestanding. Archaeologists believe they had original flat roofs, similar to other Minoans. However, this is part of the proof as the roofs have collapsed over time, of course, okay? Because, of course, those roofs were made of, usually of a non-stone-based material, usually of some wood or organic matter, and they've collapsed at the time. House tombs are most common in northern and eastern Crete in non-farming areas, circa around 2600-2300 BC. It's important for us to remember that. Why would they be in non-farming areas? Well, because these are places for the dead, and they do not want to take up valuable farming land on Crete, which is always at a premium with the houses of the dead. We're going to put these in non-fertile areas where they're not going to cause too much of a problem. And even though they were meant for this house tomb approach, they are certainly still used for communal burials, which means you're going to have quite a number of people buried in these house tombs. So this is a nice little reconstruction of what these house tombs look like. You can see that they are relatively small, okay? You have your entrances around the side here. And outside of the 
house, you have the altar and the kernos, okay? So this is a reconstruction of a typical Minoan house tomb of the early Bronze Age, showing how it would have looked shortly after construction. Note the position of the stone kernos or offering table below the step altar. So this is basically where you would pray and a kernos is where you would leave your offerings to the dead. So we do have this evidence of votive offerings to the dead here and a sort of uh, funerary or mortuary cult. Okay, so they definitely did believe that you could offer things to the dead and keep them satisfied. So this is a specific example of a house tomb. This is house tomb four in Moklos. Now, both Souls and White Law have commented on the fact that the house tombs of Moklos and other sites in Northern Crete, such as Gurnia, Safrangas, and Malia, on the assumption that each tomb of this type served a kinship group, probably to be identified as a singular nuclear family, provide evidence for a hierarchical social organisation. Since the tombs are differentiated by size, proximity to the settlement, architectural elaboration, and quality of quick grave goods. Now, what both Souls and White Law are saying here is your tomb is where your whole family would be buried, but not every house tomb looks exactly the same. So we are seeing evidence of some sort of social hierarchy going here where if you're closer to the town, and you have a bigger house tomb, we can naturally assume that you were probably of a wealthier family. However, if you're really on the outskirts of the town and your house tomb is quite small, then you're probably of a poorer family. Okay, so we do have evidence of some sort of social hierarchy here, but keep in mind that evidence is not concrete. Now, the next tomb that we have here is what's called cyst. Okay, now this is a box shaped pit lined with stone into which a corpse was put. This is incredibly common throughout the early Aegean, particularly the Cyclades region. However, we do not tend to find many in Crete. Those that we do find tend to be situated around the northeast of Crete, particularly Sifangara. Dr. Rudder suggests that this is because this is where the most Cycladic influence was found. Okay, so you can see here, it's a relatively simple tomb, okay, more of a grave than anything else, where you've literally just dug a hole, you've put stones around the side of it, and you can also see that that body, once again, as I was saying before, it's not laying down, it has been chucked in there with its knees curved and going into this sort of fetal position, okay? So we're gonna find out in the northeast of Crete, okay? So going back to our map, we're going to find it here because this is where cycladic influence, those islands surrounding the Minoan Creek to the north, is strongest. Now, the next one that we do is the Tholos tomb. Yeah, now, this is a three standing circular tomb built shortly after the introduction of house tombs on the plain of Masara, the Low Phaistos. Now, the Mycenaeans also built these. However, there are differences between the two, namely that Minoan ones are not built into hillsides and don't have as fancy masonry and tend to be rougher. Therefore, they predate them. And it's really important that you remember that, okay? Minoan ones are going to be freestanding. Mycenaean ones are going to be built into the earth, particularly into a hillside, okay? Sometimes you will get questions in the HSC where they will show you a Tholos tomb built into the hillside. And I'll say, well, what does this reveal about uh, Minoan funeral and burials? And part of that answer is you have to be able to identify off that source going, well, it's not actually Minoan tomb, it's Mycenaean. So this particular tomb does not actually tell up much. So some Minoan Tholos tombs predate the Mycenaean ones, okay? A good example of this is the Isopata tomb near Knossos. And the reason this is a good example is this is actually the exception to not having fancy mesa and being rougher. It's actually very finely constructed, okay? And this can be seen in the Mano late Minoan period. And this is often called Tholai in a group. So you can see here, 
The Solos tomb is built in this circular shape, okay? On top of this circular shape, you would have a domed roof. Now you can also see little compartments that have been established here. Now these are little storage rooms that were probably built after the Solos here became full of bodies. So these are what would be stored in the ossuaries. Okay, and we do have evidence of them being built after the fact. So as we can see here in a much clearer picture, okay, your new bodies go in the center, but once they have decayed and spent a bit of time there, they're gonna start putting the skeletons into these little side rooms. And then eventually, once they have become really old, they're gonna throw out every single bone except for the head, the little skull. You can also see that some rooms are actually bricked off as well, meaning there is no way to get in them. This is a way of basically saying that this room is full. We can't bury anybody else in here. So looking at the Isopata tomb in a bit more detail, although the vast majority of Tholos tombs are simple affairs, the Isopata tomb is different. Found near Knossos, this tomb has fine construction and a dromos that led to two deep niches in the inner hall that walled up. Now the dromos, in case we have forgotten, is the hallway leading into the tomb. These niches contained pottery, human bones and debris. This site was plundered for its masonry. However, the bones found in it and the lower indicated functions of the late Minoan to late Minoan too. Okay, so we do have evidence of rather fancy Polos tombs being built by the Minoans prior to the Mycenaeans coming in. And this is another example of a Tholos tomb at Masara. So what do we know about burial practice? Okay, well, the Minoan practice was to bury one body in each chamber when all the rooms had been used. A second burial took place in each room, then a third and a fourth and so on. When each room became crowded with bones, the skulls were collected up and the remaining bones were swept to one side. Further burials were made until the rooms became too crowded for any more. At this stage, additional rooms could be added to the original tomb or else a new tomb could be made. And that's a quote from the calendar, which I would strongly recommend that you remember in terms of talking about communal burials and ossuaries. Now, calendar suggests that large numbers of bones held within house tombs suggest that each tomb was used by one or two nuclear families over the course of centuries. And nuclear families, if you don't know what it means, it's not a nuclear power plant, okay? It is basically your traditional family, mum, dad, children, okay? So that close-knit family. Now, built tombs were accompanied by a small step altar outside. This altar may have had a stone kernos where offerings could be placed, such as the one found outside the house tombs of Gurnia. This can also be found at the Malia Acropolis and Arcane Cemetery. This may be an indication of regular cult practices outside of tombs. So your votive offerings to dead wouldn't actually happen inside of the tombs. We're thinking that they happen outside, okay? Where you're gonna leave your votive offerings and your prayers on that little kernos, not going into the tomb. Now, when we're talking about larnaxes, those sort of tubs that you'd throw the body in, um, they're not really common in Minoan society, okay? However, even with these, there could be as many as 10 corpses inside that one larnax. Additionally, larnaxes such as the Aegea triata sarcophagus could be reused with previous bodies' bones placed elsewhere. We've talked about this before. During Minoan times, however, larnaxes were quite rare. However, during the Mycenaean occupation, they became increasingly popular. And the Mycenaeans were far more focused on having individual burials than the Minoans had, who were great fans of the communal burial. Now, one of the last ones that looking at is the pithoi coffins, okay, or the jar coffins. Now, pithoi burials were a far more common form of burial privacy. In earlier times, it was largely only used for small children, however, became more common in the middle and late Minoan periods. 
So you can see why this type of burial would be used for children. You're effectively shoving them in the jar. The jar would not be that big. And when we're looking at a society with a really high infant mortality rate, you have to be able to bury them somehow. And this is how it's done. It does suggest a bit of a need for privacy for children and infancy. And they're sort of looking after them in that way. Now, Brannigan suggests that this was because individualism began creeping into Minoan society. However, Wahlberg in 1983 posits that it was merely a more efficient and cleaner way to store the dead. So what does that mean? Well, Brannigan is basically saying, because Pithoi things, burials only come a thing in the middle and late Minoan periods. And Brannigan saying, oh, around about this period, people wanted to be buried individually. They wanted to be buried separately, not in these massive communal ones. Therefore, we're looking at individualism. It's not so egalitarian anymore. Meanwhile, Warburg is just basically saying, look, we're shoving people into jars because it's just more convenient and it's just easier to store the bodies in that way. Other historians have suggested that Minoan bodies were often buried in these positions as it was reminiscent of being in a womb-like status. Okay, So you can actually see here that it's sort of in that hunched over position, like you might find a baby in the womb, and they think it might be some sort of Arthur or like or reincarnation effect. Now, looking at chamber tombs. Now, after the Mycenaean occupation, tombs became smaller and more individualistic. There is a clear evidence of social stratification in these tombs, which were by the warrior elite. So when the Mycenaeans come back over, we are certainly seeing a society where the top dogs in the society have way more elaborate and great tombs and they want to be buried away from the lower class in society. Now, these chamber tombs by the Mycenaeans were cut into the rock in the hillside and a dromos led down to the chamber. I'm going to let you do that by yourself. You should still have the calendar book, but that is a really good one to know. So you really want to know the temple tomb at Knossos and also the tomb of the double axis. They are quite important. So looking at the tomb of the double axis, okay, this one is quite an important tomb. And as you can see from this tomb, it looks like, hence its name, like the tomb was cut into the fashion of a double axe. And we know that the double axe or the labyrinth was quite significant in Minoan society, okay? And we are seeing evidence of religious ritual in the construction of the tombs. So all of these tombs might have had a specific religious purpose. So the first element stressed by Evans is the perspectival arrangement. He observed that the tomb was fashioned as if to be seen and visited. From the entrance, the first element that would capture the visitor's gaze was the central pillar. We know that the pillars were religious in the Minoan sense. The dimensions of the chamber were not so large to require such a pillar to hold up a roof, even if the roof did eventually collapse. So what they're saying is the pillar is ceremonial or aesthetic. It doesn't need to be there. It's not functional. Further, the incised patterns giving the pillar a columnar effect is immediately visible. Marinatus argues that the presence of signs identifying the pillars as focal points within the complex is the most important distinguishing feature for a pillar shrine. So what we're saying here is the tomb of the um, double axis might have functioned as a shrine as well, not just a tomb. Not every room with a pillar has to be interpreted as a shrine, especially when we're dealing with basement rooms more easily understood as storage spaces. In the case of the tomb of the double axis, however, the presence of the incised motif strongly suggests that the pillar owes its existence to reasons other than structural necessity. Our next one is the tomb of the double axis, discovered in 1913 by Evans, belongs to this new burial type. It is exceptional relative to other tombs. However, in the great number of religious symbols present, Evans longer underline in both architectural and archaeological terms the outstanding quality of the nature and contents of this tomb. In his opinion, the tomb of double axis was not only a simple burial chamber, but also a sort of shrine dedicated to the Minoan goddess. Okay, so burial chambers, and I really want you to get this, can be used as shrines as well. 
if we're following what Evans and Marinatos is suggesting here, they have an important religious role to play as well. And your tomb of the double axis is going to be your big evidence of this. So when we're looking at attitudes towards the dead, we're looking at things like most were buried without cremation until the Iron Age. So cremation was not really a big thing in Minoan society until the Iron Age. So it took quite a long time. Everything else just put in the body on display, letting it decay. In the early Minoan second period, bodies began to be placed in larnaxes to show possible individually, individuality or respect, however, it was not common. In middle Minoan and early Minoan too, bodies would be placed into pithoi or bathtub larnaxes. These, however, were not buried and put on display on the floor of the tomb, thus would have decayed by the air. Okay, so basically you put it straight in the middle of the tomb and that body's decay is going to be wafting all throughout the tomb. Now the bodies were buried in a flex position like a baby about to be born and the dead were buried with objects and offerings in the form of food and such may have been made to them after they died. The dead were often interfered with after they had rotten with bones being pushed aside but it's unclear if the Minoans thought they lost their privileged status after the flesh had rotted and the spirit had moved on. And this is a very common belief in the ancient societies. There's some religions such as the Zoroastrian religion that still believes in these customs where the spirit of the body is trapped inside of the rotting body. And it's imperative to remove the flesh as quickly as possible for that spirit to escape. Hence why the vulture is an important bird in the Zoroastrian religion because it pecks the flesh away from the body and releases the spirit. So lastly, we're looking at rituals, okay? And to look at rituals, the big thing that we want to look at is the Gaia Triada sarcophagus. Now, the sarcophagus of the Gaia Triada shows a religious ritual on both of its sides. One panel shows two goddesses on a chariot driven by griffins. The other panel has a chariot conveying a man in the company of a goddess. She is taking him away in a vehicle, a chariot. The side panels depict a religious sacrifice and offering made to the dead. The dead man stands dressed in what appears to be a long covering cloak outside of the tomb. From this larnax, we see that the burial, at least for the rich, was accompanied by the sacrifice of animals for presentation of offerings. I'm just going to change my screen just so I can see a couple of things. So what do we have here? Well, we can see it. Okay, it's very richly decorated. Okay. And we can see in the middle of the larnax, there is a bull. It has been sacrificed, it's been tied up to that table. And we have evidence of what appears to be the female priesthood. Okay, because remembering that female um, priesthood was quite important, quite notable to Minoan society. Okay, you can see that the body was effectively just shoved in there. You can also see how it looks particularly like a bathtub. And we have evidence that when the person died, their bathtub went with them and their bathtub functioned as their coffin. So this is from the side, okay? And we can see that it's quite richly decorated. Now, both depict women in chariots. The panel on the left has the chariot drawn by a goat-shaped horse, or is a goat as large as a horse? We're not too sure. While the panel on the right features griffins. And there's been a lot of discussion about what this might actually mean, but some people have discussed that it's potentially the Minoan goddess lifting up the spirit of the person who has died and taking them away to the afterlife in the chariot. This is side A of the Agia Triada sarcophagus, and it's believed to depict burial ceremonies, including offerings given to the deceased, who is perhaps the armulus figure at the far right, standing in front of the shrine tomb. So he has been buried. And we think that these people are giving votive offerings. So they're going to leave those offerings with the dead person so that they can take them into the afterlife. We are also noting quite a lot of these upper class Minoan women who we might be able to distinguish by their white skin, fancy headdress, and also looking at their hairstyles. And they seem to be leading in the Minoan procession. 
Now, this is side B of the Gaetriata sarcophagus. So you can see here that we've actually reconstructed some of it from the previous picture. Okay. And it sustains some damage, but it depicts the sacrifice of a bull in the center. And it's also shown by a procession of women accompanied by a male flute player, which you can see here, who are approaching an altar in front of a small shrine. The shrine has horns of consecration, that ever important symbol that we definitely need. Now, the very last thing that I will be talking to you about is canonical cups or conical cups. Now, these are the most common item found in Minoan sites, and it's an everyday object. They also had a particular role to play in cult and funeral rites, which is why so many of them have been found in religious settings. Now, if you're wondering what it is, it is literally the cup, okay? Sometimes might be used for bowls, and it's used for, as you might imagine, it's storing food and drink. Now, you might be asking, well, why on earth is that you know, um, important? Well, some of these cups, as you might have figured, contain food, others were painted red. Some might have been used for communal meals, others held non-edible offerings. So what we think happened is these cups would be filled with these votive offerings, which might sometimes be food for the dead, but also other things. And you would place your offering inside this cup, you might leave it on the kernels, and this is how your offering would be delivered to the dead person. This is how you pay your respects or acknowledge them religiously. All right. That's it for Minoan burials and tombs. Like I said, there's a couple of tombs in there that you have to research a bit into your own depth, usually by using the calendar book. You have to know those tombs, but this is your general overview of every one of those um, tomb types. Okay, so if you have any questions, please email.